But anyway, praise God. What a beautiful covenant that God has made with us. That, that he would be our God. We would be his people. That he would forgive our iniquities. That he would remember our sins no more. And that he would never leave us or forsake us. I mean, what an amazing covenant that we now have in the Lord. And, uh, you know, when we read about Israel, I mean, this week's Torah portion, lots, lots of information. Hope, hopefully you read it. It's Beha um, Adlocha, which means when you set up. It starts out in Numbers chapter 8, verse 1, through chapter 12 and verse 16, the Haftorah reading the, from the prophets. It's the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. And a lot of information this week that God gave commandments and instructions to Israel through Moses. And remember what he told Moses. Do exactly as I tell you, because these are earthly patterns, earthly uh, formula for things in heaven, the things we cannot see. That's why it's so powerful when we read the Old Testament. And people say, oh, you're reading the old, you're trying to go backwards, you're trying to get legalistic. No. These are all examples for our walk with the Lord today. In other words, we're, we are looking back through the eyes of the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. And the Bible specifically says, because people will question, what are you doing reading the old things? How many people have been questioned about that? Where are new covenant believers? What are you reading the old stuff? I would refer to them to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which says the following about the things that have been written in the past. For us, New Covenant believers, beginning in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses. In other words, even baptism. All of Israel passed through the Red Sea, and were baptized unto Moses, verse 2, in the cloud and in the sea. And verse 3 says, And they did all eat the same spiritual meat, and they did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And notice what that rock was. Was Christ, was the Messiah. In other words, all of Israel was baptized, and all of Israel drank, and were witnesses to that rock, and that rock is the Messiah. And then when the Messiah comes to his own people, most of them reject him and don't recognize him. Even to this day, most Jewish people don't recognize the Messiah. And he's been with our people from the very beginning. I mean, that is, that is amazing. Is that what it says there? That rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Was the Messiah. Even though they, that we as Jewish people don't recognize him, he makes himself, I mean, he makes himself available to us. He's still following us. He's still seeking us. He's still trying to open up our hearts and our minds to accept him in our lives. And as a Jewish person, when you accept the Messiah of Israel, you don't change religion. Like I told, like I, I told the person yesterday, I'm a completed Jew now. I now feel complete. I've never been more Jewish in my entire life. Because I'm following the king of the Jews. And the one who, who the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and the disciples said that followed him. He said, we beheld his glory. I mean, when we do things his way, glory has to follow, like Luz was saying. Miracles. Supernatural. We are witnesses to the supernatural. Yeshua said, you are my witnesses. In other words, when we get up here, we talk about the things that God has done in our lives, personal God, that we have experienced. Not that we're reading some Bible story that somebody else wrote about their experience with God. We are testifying to the experiences we now have with God. And when you experience God, who's going to talk you out of God? When you, when you really experience God for yourself... No one needs to brainwash you. No one needs to tell you. You are my witnesses. And the covenant says they shall all know me. That we shall all know him. And it says from the least to the greatest. Even if the devil has convinced you you're the worst believer. And of course he does that. 
How many people has he told you? You're the worst, but you're the worst. I'm pointing, I'm not pointing to you, Billy. I'm just pointing in general. But I'm sure he's told you that, right? That you're like the last, the worst. I mean, he told me the same stuff. He's such a dog, talking about the adversary. But even the least of us, that we would all know him, from the least to the greatest. Now, what makes a person least and what makes a person great in the kingdom of God? If you were a disobedient child, would that make you great in the kingdom of God? If you never did what God said, that would make you least. So obedience is better than sacrifice. When you and I obey God, it makes us great. This is my son. The Father spoke from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Why is the Father so pleased with the Son of God, with the Messiah? Because my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, my, my, my reason for living is to show obedience to a disobedient world, to a fallen world, to a world that goes against God, yeah. to a world that submits to the adversary and resists the God who created us. And most people are like that, myself included. And what happens when you reject God? He rejects you. And what happens when you get rejected by God? Do you do well? You do horrible. And this life becomes, life is tough enough with God. Imagine a life without God. I don't even know how I made it this far as I made it until I came to the Lord. I mean, I was spent. We were talking about that last night. He who waits on the Lord shall renew their strength. In other words, I was, I was, I was spent by the time I came to God. And thank God I, I started to learn how to wait on the Lord and, and abide in Him and just start to seek Him. And, and God renewed my strength. And God renewed my youth. And even though the outer man is perishing, like Paul said, the inner man, the person, I am younger on the inside and I'm getting on the outside. It's not so bad. But imagine wasting away spiritually and wasting away physically. That's a double whammy. The Bible calls that twice dead. It's bad enough we die physically. Do Should we die spiritually? Horrible. That's, that's a nightmare you don't wake up from. So God renews your spirit on the inside. Why does he renew your spirit? Because we seek him. Because we love him. Because we, we, we talk to him. We have fellowship with him. We have a relationship with God. And he rewards those that diligently seek him. And I mean... That's, that should be everyone's claim, that we are being rewarded as we seek Him. And the more you seek Him, the greater you'll be, the, the, be, the better your life will be. So it says, verse 4 again in, in 1 Corinthians 10, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ, means the word Messiah. The rock was Mashiach. But with many of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, verse 5 says that after they came out of Egypt, after salvation, they were doing things that were not pleasing to God. How many know you could be born again a child of God and still do things that don't please the Lord? You ever hear the terminology that we grieve the Holy Spirit? As a parent, when your children are disobedient, does that grieve you? That's grief. That causes grief in a parent's life. And many of us cause grief in our father's life because our ways are not his ways. Because he wants us to do what he says. If you keep my commandments, he tells Israel. If you hear, if you do, you shall be above everyone. I'll bless, I'll bless your socks off, he tells Israel. They, didn't wear, they weren't wearing socks in those days. I'll bless your sandals off. <laughs> I'll bless you above everyone else. I will reward you when you do what I tell you. Is, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeshua comes into the world. Does the message change? If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I tell you. 
Are his commandments grievous? Oh, no, if you do what God says, your life will be boring, your life will be terrible, you'll, you'll, you, it'll, it, you'll be sad, you know, whatever, you won't be able to party anymore, you won't be able to enjoy your life anymore. And it's the exact opposite. When you do what God says, your life becomes exciting. Your life becomes wonderful. You smile a lot. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And when you see him move in your life, you're like amazed. God did this, and God did that. And he was there for me. And he's always there. He's omnipresent. So can you mess up after salvation? Can you go in the wrong direction after salvation? Now, does that mean you lose your salvation? You'll, admit you'll lose your joy. You'll lose that skip in your step. You'll be dragged across the line. And uh, it's sad because I've watched many brothers and sisters and they just, they don't want to get with the program. What's the program? Whatever he tells you that is biblical. Just do what he tells you. So verse 6 says that the things that happened to Israel were, were, are useless to us. We're new covenant believers. You're reading about Israel. You're reading ancient Israel. It means nothing. It says the opposite in verse 6. Sometimes you've got to tell the devil, it is written, devil, because you're just a liar. How many know a lot of brothers and sisters are influenced by these lies, and they believe a lie is the truth? And I guess if you tell a lie long enough, they'll think it's true. I don't know how many Christians that I've met. Oh, the Old Testament. I remember a famous pastor. I watched him on TV with my own eyes. The largest congregation, the largest church in South Florida. And he, and he wrote down all the commandments in the Torah and the law of Moses. He had them on a big poster board. He says, I don't even bother reading them. From his lips. He held them up. These are the 613 commandments. I don't bother reading them. We're not under the law. And he threw them on the floor. And I said, Esther, you're not going to believe what I just saw. And I said, his days are numbered. And his days were numbered. He was on his way out. They got a restraining order on him. He couldn't even step on the church grounds anymore. You don't mess with God. The commandments of God are written in stone. Can't erase them. Can't sweep them under the, uh, uh, under the rug. You can preach that garbage that you don't have to keep God's laws. How many know God has empowered us by the Holy Spirit to keep God's laws? The exact opposite of what a lot of brothers and sisters are believing today. And they're in trouble. They're saved and in trouble. Can you be saved and in trouble? Speak to Israel. They were saved and they were in trouble. Oh, I'm saved and I'm in trouble. Is that fun to be in trouble as a child of God? Was it fun to be in trouble as your parents were upset with you as a physical child where you were under constant consequences? In my day, they, I mean, we got spanked. Now it's child abuse. Now it's attention deficit disorder. Oh, we, we had attention deficit disorder, but with a good spanking, you paid attention. Now they put you on a pill, and they make a zombie out of you. Oh, that's okay. That's good parenting. We had attention deficit disorder for about five minutes. You got a good whack, and you paid attention. Didn't need no pill. Just got a little push there, and then it's like, are you paying attention? Oh, yeah, Mom. Oh, yeah, Dad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm paying attention. Oh, yeah. What, what would you like me to do? Now you touch a child. Oh, it's child abuse. No, not correcting a child is child abuse. So now these things... Verse 6, what things? The things that Israel went through. 
that we read about, that we study. These things are our examples to the intent that we should not what? Lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, wherever God has you right now after your salvation, you should be thanking God and praising God. And not complain, because we don't have any complainers here. I was the only one, right? I didn't get the memo either. I wish I would have gotten the memo earlier. I would have done a lot less complaining. And, I, and I, I've noticed in my own life, just like in theirs, the more I complained, I'm not going to say I was going backwards, but I was going nowhere. They weren't going anywhere either. And the more they complained, the more upset he got. Because he said, they don't understand my ways. And here we are, 21st century, and we're still questioning God. What is his way? What does he want? For, how many people have said, what does God want for my life? What does God want from your life? He wants you to be conformed to the image of his son. He wants you to be like Yeshua. He's the model citizen for heaven. You and I are in heavenly training on this earth for a short amount of time. This is, this is heavenly university. Yay or nay? Where are you going? I want to go to heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? I mean, I'm being, you and I are being trained for heaven. And, and who's the role model for heaven? You and I? No. Yeshua is the role model. This is my son, whom I am well pleased. He took him up to the mountain of transfiguration, right? Peter, James, John. Moses shows up to the picture. Elijah was there. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing the prophets. Did he say, listen to Moses, listen to Elijah? He didn't say that. The prophets and the law spoke about my son, spoke about the Messiah. You listen to him. In other words, don't raise up Moses above Yeshua. Don't raise up the prophets above Yeshua. Don't raise up the apostles above Yeshua. I've seen people fighting. Don't contradict Yeshua with any other part of the Bible. He's the pinnacle of the Bible. He's the one who was spoken of in the Word of God. Don't raise up Moses above Yeshua. Don't raise up Paul above Yeshua. Don't raise up anybody above him. He is the King of Righteousness. He is a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek, from the tribe of Judah, the Lion of Judah. I mean, many of us have made that mistake that we are raising up other people above Yeshua. Don't make that mistake. I'm not going to say that's a fatal mistake, but it's a bad mistake. You don't want to raise up Yeshua. You don't want to use any part of the Bible to contradict what Yeshua said. Amen. Yay or nay? We're going to err on the side of caution. Are you with me? So they lusted. They got in trouble. They weren't happy with their situation. God was trying to teach them something. That's what the Holy Spirit's reminding me. When you're not happy in whatever situation God has you in, you're not learning what you're supposed to be learning. Amen. Because how I many know oh, God is a teacher? Amen. God is teaching. Yeshua said, learn of me. That means we're to learn who's the teacher. He's the teacher. Who's the teacher? Holy Spirit is the teacher. Whatever situation you're in, instead of complaining, ask the Lord, what is it that you would like for me to learn? Amen. A little bit better? Yeah. What is it that I'm supposed to learn in the situation that I'm in right now? Because if you start complaining, you will be in that situation longer. Because that's what happened to them. If these are examples for us that we should not lust, that we should not complain, it's an, it's an example for us. And we've all done it, myself included, that I've complained. God, why did you allow this? God, why did you allow that? Why am I in this circumstance? Why is this happening in my life? Why is that happening in my life? And what happened? I stayed in the situation longer. 
Now it's like, God, what would you have me to learn in this situation? I'm not, I don't like it. Does every situation, do we have to like every situation? No. You know, why are we getting this mana from heaven every day? Instead of saying, thank God, I don't have to work for food. It just shows up every day. Groceries are delivered to my tent door every day. And on the sixth day, twice as much. So I don't have to even gather on the seventh day. No, no, let's have some meat. We're sick of this mana. I'm sick of my job. I'm sick of my wife. I'm sick of my husband. I'm sick of the situation. What happens when you talk like that to God? You'll stay there longer. One more, one more, uh, one more. Uh, what you may call it? Round about Mount Sinai. Take another. Take another. Take another trip around Mount Sinai. God, why am I going through the same thing over and over? Because you didn't learn the first time. Yeah or nay? How many of us have gone through the same situation over and over? Why, Lord? Because you complained? Because you didn't get it? Because you didn't get the lesson? Because when you get the lesson, you move on. It'll be some other challenge. It's like, Lord, why am I in this situation? What is it that you want me to learn? In other words, we should be in student mode all the time instead of complaining mode. Why this? Why that? I mean, how many know he's the ultimate choreographer? And all things work together? Does he work all things together for the good, for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose? Lord, what is your purpose in my life? God's purpose in my life and your life is to be conformed? He took us deformed. Did God, did God accept you the way you were, the way I was? And he wants you to stay like, like that, right? Deformed. What does it say? He chastises, he corrects every child whom he receives. He corrects. Why is he correcting me? Why does he want me to change? Can't I just, can't I just be lifted up? into heavenly places, even though I was dead in my trespass? Can I, just st can I just still be dead in my trespasses and in my sins? You want me to stop trespassing? You want me to stop sinning? You want to change my behavior? I was happy being dead. I was happy dead man walking. You mean you want to transform me by the renewing of my mind? You want me to think different? You want me to act different? What a mean God. I mean, he's an awesome God. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. Change me. I don't want to think and act like I used to. That's what was killing us. And we resist the lessons. And life is the lessons. Our life, our situations is the lesson. Why did you put me here? Why did you take me there? Why did you allow this to happen? All things are working together because you and I declared our love for God. And he is training us and he is teaching us and he's using life to do it. He's using circumstances in our life to teach us all these things. And if you don't get angry, and if you don't do a lot of complaining, and God forbid you don't quit, you're going places in the kingdom of God. But I've seen a lot of brothers and sisters, they get mad at God. They don't like their situation. They don't like where they're at. They want something else. They have a better idea of how they should live. We got some big ideas. We got some big plans. And we argue with God. And we get mad at God. And some of us, God forbid, even walk away from God. I know this because I've, I've been the leader of this congregation over 30 years. I've seen a lot of, I've seen more people quit than start. And does that make my, does that give me joy? 
that breaks my heart because you just, because if you love God, everything's working together. What happens if you say, I don't love you, God, anymore? I don't want you anymore. It's game over. How can he deal with somebody that doesn't love him anymore? How does he deal with you? Does he reject you? No, you rejected him. Once you reject him, you're back to square one. I rejected him for the first half of my life. How did it go for you? Terrible. Horrible. It was a nightmare. And you think I'm going to reject him now? I complained until I learned that complaining just keeps you in the situation longer. We've all done it. If you can't say amen, say oh me. And we've complained. What happens when you complain? You don't go anywhere. Haven't learned. Haven't gone forward. Haven't gotten it. So these things are examples to us, verse 6, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. In other words, we they wanted something different than they were getting. In other words, many of us have made that mistake that we wanted something else in our lives than what we were getting. Instead of thanking God, whatever it is, that whatever our situation is, we were complaining that we didn't like what we were getting. So, and neither be idolaters, verse 7, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, and neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000 people, verse 8, and neither let us tempt the Messiah, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them, for who? For in samples or examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands... Verse 12, take heed lest he fall. And notice what it says in verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tested or tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, whatever situation, whatever test you and I are under, it won't be above your, your capability. And in every situation, there's a way to escape it. There's a way to get through it. And the Lord said it. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rains descended, the floods, the winds beat on that house, and that house did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. The same rock that followed them, that they disobeyed. Because what happens when you disobey the rock? You're, you're on sand. You're either on solid ground, which is Yeshua, which is the rock, or you're building your life on sand. And what happens when you're on sand? You don't have a sure foundation. And then the winds, the rains, the floods come, beat on your house, same situation, and the outcome is completely different. Your house falls apart. Either your life stays together or your life falls apart. How many know most people live, their, ho their life falls apart all the time? My life used to fall apart all the time. Now I, my, my foundation is the rock. My rock is Messiah, is Mashiach, whatever he said. So when the winds, the rains, and the floods, the situations arise in my life, the circumstances that are difficult in my life and your life, I'm standing on a rock. In other words, it's going to blow, it's going to flood, it's going to rain, and it's going to beat on your house, and the outcome will be a positive outcome or will be a negative outcome. And it all has to do with how you react to the situation in your life. Yay or nay? That's powerful information. Because I, how many people, their lives fall apart all the time? And if your life falls apart, a lot of times, what happens? You lose the will to live even. God, take me home. How many people have prayed that? Take me home. Kill me. Get me out of here. 
Because how many, how many times can you fall apart before you lose your will to live even? But, but what happens if situations happen in your life? You're standing on the rock, Yeshua, you're standing on the rock, you're standing on a sure foundation, and the rains, the winds, the floods come, and you don't fall apart, and you come out victorious. And, and you come out more than a conqueror, Messiah Yeshua, who loves us. And you, and you, and you prevail. And you do well, no matter what comes at, at you. It builds your faith. It makes you stronger. You're not praying for the rapture every day. You're not praying for your life to be over. You're like, yeah, it worked. He's with us. The outcome was positive. Yes, the devil tried this. Yes, the adversary threw this. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And when you get a few experiences like that under your belt, it builds faith. It builds confidence. Not in ourselves, in him. Because he said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you would say to this circumstance, to this mountain in your life, you would say, be removed. Out. And it would obey you and you would get through it and you would go like, wow, this works. And what happens when you see something work? You want to tell everybody. What happens when something doesn't work? You want to tell everybody. You're going to tell everybody no matter what. You know that. We're blabbermouths. I went to that restaurant, the worst food I ever had. I went to this restaurant, it's the best food we ever had. You got to go there. Right? I tried Yeshua. It works. It's amazing. He delivered me. He restored me. He blessed me. He turned my life around. He made me happy. He made me joyful. I mean, taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, like, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I'm still trying it out. I'm not sure yet. No, this works. It's amazing what God has done in my life. Yeah, I've met some challenges. I've had some winds, some floods, some rains. I've had some stuff come at me. In the world, you will have tribulation, Yeshua said. You're going to have problems no matter what. Be of good cheer, he said. I have overcome the world. You can't be of good cheer until you overcome in this world. If this world overcomes you, are you going to be happy? Oh, I had a terrible week. Hallelujah. I went from bad to worse. It came against me. I fell apart again. It was terrible. Praise Jesus. No, it's like, wow. The adversary came against. The enemy came against us. The enemy formed this whole thing. He tried to really take us out. He tried to do this. He tried to do that. But we stood firm. And we stood firm on the word of God. And we didn't move. And we just, I will not be moved. And I just stood firm. It, it came against us, but it didn't prosper. I mean, 28 years we're married. How many times has the adversary try to, try to destroy this congregation? I mean, how many times has the adversary come against this congregation and caused division and caused strife among the brothers and sisters and try to pull people out and has pulled people out and people talk garbage about this place? At least they're talking about us. I mean, the adversary's tried. Has he succeeded? No. Hasn't been able to succeed. Has he tried every trick in the book? Has he caused divisions? Has he done weapons against us as a congregation? But the, the gates of hell have not prevailed. We're still here. 
Somebody say, we're still here. 33 years later, we're still here. And the adversary has tried every trick in the book. And he loves to turn one against the other. Loves to do that. Loves to do that. He did it in heaven. He caused a third of the angelic beings to fall because he did that. Does he still do it today? Absolutely. Will he try and pull you out of a congregation? Out of a, if you're called here, of course he's going to try and pull you out. That's his job. Try to pull me out from day one. I remember he was working on my mom for a while. My mom was ready to leave. She got offended over something. You know, the usual. That self-righteous stuff. And my mom started to talk trash. And I was like, Mom, are you serious? Where do you think you're going? Where do you think you're going to go? She was ready to leave. I mean, your own mother. Oh, 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 I think that happened in this week's Torah portion. Moses' sister. She, she didn't like that Moses married an Ethiopian woman. She didn't look Jewish. Moses' sister came against him, came against his marriage. Amen? And what happened? She got leprous. She got leprosy. Why? Because Moses was, wasn't perfect? I mean, no, Moses was a man of God. And God used Moses in a mighty Was Moses a perfect? It doesn't say what happened to Zipporah. Did they get divorced? So you mean Moses was a divorced man? And then he married an Ethiopian woman? Oh my God. His sister wasn't happy. And she got, she got leprosy. And then Moses is interceding for her. I would have said, take her, Lord. <laughs> She's a pain in my uh, Torah. My own sister came against me also. Don't kid yourself. Then my mother, the devil was working on my mother. I'm like. And Moses interceded. But she was put out of the camp for a, for a week. And, and Judaism, speaking evil of one of another, it's called Lashon Hara, the evil tongue. You need to be careful how you judge because you will be judged. It doesn't say you can't judge. It says how you judge, you will be judged. How you measure, it will be measured back to you. In other words, if you're this big critic, careful. It may come and bite you back, your own criticism. Because things are not always what they appear. Amen? Judge righteous judgment, Yeshua said. In other words, take it easy. Be merciful one to another as God has had mercy on you and I. Are you with me? We're quick to... But anyway... We're to wish well on each other. Moses, congratulations. You found, you found a good wife. Uh, you know, I'm sorry Zipporah wasn't with the program. That she called you a bloody man. She didn't like this circumcision business, remember? On the way, and God warned Moses, if you don't circumcise your children, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, Moses. And the wife said, no. And then she got mad, and you're a bloody man. No, he's a bloody God. Better his blood than your blood. 
Better his punishment than your punishment. Amen? Better he took the punishment for our sin than we carry it ourselves. That's why he started out his ministry. Repent! In other words, ask God for forgiveness while you can. I'm amazing, 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 amazing. An amazing God. Where was we? Complaining. I mean, that should be enough on complaining. You should stop complaining, right? Somebody say, Father in heaven, I'm sorry for complaining. I must have said that to him a hundred times already. Sorry, Dad. Didn't know any better. But And, and, and then there's another portion in, the, in this week's Torah portion where, where God, there was a cloud over the tabernacle in the wilderness, in the desert, and there was fire at night. And then God began to teach them that when the cloud was lifted, they would move. They would go forward. And when the cloud stayed, they stayed. So God was already teaching them under the first covenant to be led by God. I mean, we need that kind of lesson. We don't have smoke signals, though. And we don't have fire. Those who are the Spirit, they're the sons of God. It's exciting to be led of God. Because when you're led of God, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me. Where is he going to lead you? Still waters and green pastures. He's going to restore your soul. He's, gonna, he's, a, he's in the restoration business. But to be led by God means when he says move, you move. And when he says stop, you stop. And I've heard this from people. I prayed and God didn't answer me. I said, yes, he did answer you. He told you no. So how many people have made requests to God and he didn't give you their request? Did he answer you? Yes, he said no. Because if you would have said yes, you would have had your request. So he said no. Thank you, Lord, for saying yes at the right times and saying no at the right times. Because if he said yes to everything I prayed for and you prayed for, where would we be today? All things work together for the good. Are all things good? No. Do all things feel good? No. But they work together for the good because we love him. And does he love us? And because he loves us, does he want to change our lives? Does he want to change our minds? Does he want to change the way we think? the way we do, should we complain while we're going through this? I mean, you know that Paul writes in one of his epistles, one of his letters, the clay cannot tell the potter. When I was going through my complaining stage in my walk with the Lord, this lady came up to me. And she said, God told me to tell you something. You know, when, when I was like, okay, what? What I do now? And she said, God told me to tell you the clay cannot tell the potter what to do. Because I was telling the potter what to do, and I'm the clay. We're the clay. He's the potter. And at first, I got offended. You know, because nobody likes correction. Come on, say amen. And then I realized she was right. I was telling God what to do. I was complaining. I was telling God, basically, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, I was, I was a big-time complainer. It's in my DNA. It's in the Jewish DNA. And it was like, yes, I had to admit, she, what she's told me was right. I can't tell him what to do because I was going through some circumstances in my life that most believers wouldn't make it. 
I got to the point in my life, in my walk with the Lord, I was like, Lord, I can't take this anymore. It's beyond painful what's happening in my life. There were so many changes going on and so many things that he was doing, and it was painful. Things were disappearing, all these things that I, that I lived for and that I put together and that, that was my life. My life was being pulled apart, and I was like, Lord, what are you doing in my life? But all the things that I did were without him. Without me, you can do nothing. So everything I did, he had to, he had to, he had to clean, like, like clear the, the, the slate in order to start building a life that he wanted me to live. But I had to go through the deconstruction period, and it was very painful. He deconstructed my life to construct my life. And, and, and that's when we lose a lot of brothers and sisters in the deconstruction phase. As God is making some radical changes in your life that you put together and that was your idea or that was your plan or that was your thing, it didn't work out. And now God is, 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 is taking it apart because now he's going to do something else in your life. And it's like, whoa. But everything he did worked together for the good because I'm where I am today, had he not done all those things, I would not be here. My life would be completely different. And now I'm praising God and I'm thanking God for every blood, sweat, and tear and every and every and everything he took apart and everything that he took away and everything that he put back. Everything is just perfect. Because he's perfect. God is perfect. Everything he did was perfect. It perfectly worked together in my life. I mean, I can't speak for your life. I can only speak for what I've experienced in my own life. But exactly as the scripture says, that's exactly the way he did things. Was it painful? Yes. The change was painful. But the results are amazing. I'm in such a different place spiritually and mentally and and everything that is in my life now, it's amazing. But he had to do like a full sweep. He had to do like a, a full restoration And it was just so much change. And one of the things that we resist as human beings is change. We get into situations, even, even things that are not good for us, and we hang on to them even though they're not good for us because we resist change. It's like I know what I have. I don't know what I'm going to get. But with God, it's exciting to get what he gives you because every good gift comes from above. From the Father of lights, and whom there's no, no, there's no turning. Everything he does is perfect. If we allow God to do and make the changes that are necessary in our life, although painful, although confusing, although, although we don't understand them, that in the, when, you see the, when you see the finished product, it's like, wow. And I think back to myself, I was ready to quit. I was ready to walk away. I was ready to give up. And that, and let me tell you something, that enters into, I, I don't know any believers that it hasn't entered into your mind to give up and walk away because you didn't like what was going on in your life. And then, of course, you have all these people like, like, like Job had, curse God and die. Give it up. How many people around you telling, give it up. Give it up. The same thing. Give it up, Gabriel. Look, a Jewish person believing in Jesus. <laughs> Look what happened to you. The best thing that ever happened to me was Yeshua in my life. Because they're still where they are. And I've moved, I have moved past light years ahead. Oh, yeah, I had to take a couple steps backwards. I had to... Had to go through some stuff, had to go through some changes. But thank God the comforter was there, the Holy Spirit, the whole time to comfort me. Well, I, and He's the anesthesia through the operation. Because when God starts to operate on your life, it is painful. There's some dice, there's some, there, there's some cuts, there's some dissection, there's some circumcision of the heart. You know, you ever been to a baby circumcision? Everybody's happy but the one being circumcised. He's screaming his lungs out. And everybody's like, Mazel Tov, oh, congratulations. He's like, ah. I tell the rabbi, at least let him swallow the wine before you cut. 
they put a little wine on his tongue and he didn't even swallow. And I'd be giving him a whole bottle of wine, poor kid. And here, bite on this, this dowel. He's like, <laughs> and then God says, let me circumcise your heart that you may learn to love me with all your heart. So let me cut away some things out of your life that you loved more than God. How many know that can be very painful? Word of God says, neither be idolaters as some of them were. Because we idolize not necessarily gods of wood and stone, but we idolize things and people in our lives. If you can't say amen, say oh me. And when God cuts them out of your life, it can be very painful. And you can get angry at God and you can think in your mind, I, I'm going to give this up. This is no good. I've never been in so much pain before. But the Bible says the opposite. If you endure chastening, if you endure correction, let's read that exactly the way it says it. Are you with me? Somebody say, there's nothing, there's nothing like a trip with the Lord. There's nothing, nothing on earth that even comes close than being on, on, a, uh, being on this spiritual journey with the Lord. Verse 6, Hebrews chapter 12. For whom the Lord loves, he lets you do whatever you want to. Because he's just an old man with a poor memory that doesn't care what you do because you're under grace. No, what does it say? For whom the Lord loves? Somebody say, God loves me. Does God love us? God loves you. God loves me. So what's he going to do because I love him and he loves me? He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Everyone? Raise your hand. You and me? This for everybody? But, verse 8, if you be without, in other words, I don't like what's going on, Lord, I'm leaving. I don't love you anymore. I can't take it. You've thought about it. Come on. We've all thought about it. Somebody say amen. amen. I thought about walking away from the Lord. Because, I mean, what? You like chastisement and being rebuked and being corrected? No. So if you be without this correction business, whereof we are all partakers, then are you... Fatherless? I mean, you enjoy being fatherless? Being without God? Being fatherless? No God? How was your life without God? Somebody say terrible. Terrible. So if you, if you don't like what he's doing, then are you bastards without God and without your father and you're not sons? So in other words, we have a choice. Furthermore, verse 9, we have had fathers of our flesh, earthly parents, which corrected us. You're, did, your, did your parents correct you? And we, and we did what? We gave them reverence. We respected them. And shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Should we subject, should we submit ourselves? See, the difference is when you were corrected as a child, you didn't have much of a choice. You couldn't leave. You'd get a little suitcase. You'd get to the front door that you're going to run away, and you maybe you get to the sidewalk, and you're like, I got no money. I got no job. I don't have a driver's license. Where am I going? <laughs> but like King David said, as adults, you can't run away from God either. If I go to the bottom of the ocean, you're there. If I go to the top of the mountain, you're there. If I hide under my bed, you're there. You can run from God, but you can't hide. And he made the earth round. 
So even if you run fast, you end up in the same place. <laughs> and if you get in a rocket, maybe you can make it to the moon where there's nothing. And you got to come back because you need food and air. So can you run from God? Can you run from your parents home when you were little? So we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of Spirits? What happens when we submit to God? We live. What happens when we go against God? We die. For they, our earthly parents, verse 10, rarely for a few days chasing those after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. He is conforming us into his image and his likeness. Why does he want us to be like Yeshua? Because Hebrews chapter 1 says that Yeshua, as a person, is the express image of God as a human being. In other words, that's the way he wants us to be. What a mean God. And he's going to pry you, and he's going to push you, and he's going to squish you, and he's going to twist you, and he's going to turn you upside down, and he's going to shake you, and he's going to push you this way, and he's going to pull you that way, and he's going to conform you into the image of his son so that we could be partakers of his holiness. Because God says, I'm holy, and I want you to be holy. Yea or nay? So when we're being pulled apart like taffy, and we're being pride, we're being pride and, and pushed, and this and that, and that's happening, and all these things are working together in my life, because God is orchestrating all these things so that we could be conformed to the image of His Son. Somebody say amen. amen. Verse 11, now no chastening for the, for the present seems to be joyous. No kidding. You mean we we're under correction? I mean, hallelujah. You know, and we know that, that all things work together. It's like, and, and, we, and we rejoice in tribulation. Right? How many people are like, hallelujah, I lost my job. Hallelujah, my company went bankrupt. Hallelujah, the wife left. And she took my dog. I'm sure going to miss him. That's a joke, by the way. And I have no money in the bank. Hallelujah. I don't know where my next meal is coming from. Hallelujah. I don't know where I'm going to be living. Hallelujah. No. By God. Now, how do you go from prideful and independent to lowly and meek? I mean, how do you take somebody from being prideful? Come on now. And independent, I don't need anybody, including God. That's the way I was. And now you make them lowly and meek and completely dependent on God. How do you take somebody from that kind of mindset to the other kind of mindset? You got to bring, you got to, he's got to bring us through some stuff to be lowly and meek. And the more prideful you are, the more independent I don't need God. I can do all things by myself. I don't need your help. It's like when I left my house when I was 16, fighting with my mother, and I said, I don't need you, and I'm leaving. And she said, no problem, I'm not going to help you. And I said, I don't need your help. Now, you think I had an easy time as a 16-year-old leaving my house with no help? Oh, yeah, joy. I had such a great time as a 16-year-old all on my own. I mean, I went from, from shame to shame. And, and, and 
while my brother and sister stayed home and they were living in Argentina. In Argentina, every if you if you have if you have two bucks, you have somebody there living with you, taking care of your home. You have a live-in. My brother and sister with a live-in, breakfast in bed, and I'm sucking wind out here in the because I'm on my own. And I'm cleaning tables for a living, and I'm washing dishes. Which in Argentina, that's, a, that's like a low-class thing to do. Here, oh, I'm a waiter. There, you're like, you don't even want to tell people you're a waiter. <laughs> in Latin America, a waiter is not a glorious job. That's kind of like, I'm a waiter. And i got to put a stupid bow tie on and wear these stupid jackets. May I help you? And you got to wait on people. And I'm, a, and I'm a janitor, and I'm cleaning kids' schools and toilets. Have you ever seen what kids do in bathrooms? <laughs> like the toilet's the cleanest place in the room because they miss it. <laughs> then most of them don't even come close to the toilet. It's everywhere around the toilet. And somebody's got to clean it. I'm cleaning toilets. Oh, Mom, I'm on my own. I don't need you. Oh, God, I'm on my own. I don't need you, God. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, after you go through some correction. It yields. It, it accomplishes something in your life and my life. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with everyone and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace and holiness. In other words, does he want us to be like him? Is that an unreasonable request? That our Father in heaven wants us to be like him? Somebody say, that's a reasonable request. We come from him. Our bodies come from the earth, but our souls come from him. And he wants us to be like him. And he's given us the perfect example of who he is in the person of Yeshua. That, he, that Yeshua is the express image of God, is a person. And if we're to be like God, we have to be like who? Arnold Schwarzenegger? John Wayne? You know? We're supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be like him. Now, how do you take somebody who's nothing like him, like myself, nothing like him, and you make him, and, and you bring him along, and you make this person that knew nothing about God and was nothing like God, and you bring him, what, what, what do you have to bring him through, and what do you have to do in a person's life to make him like Yeshua? I mean, you've got to go through some stuff. You've got to go through some stuff that's not very pleasant. And I, I remember saying to the Lord, this is so humiliating what you're bringing me through. I'm humiliated. And people are like right there watching you be humiliated. And they mock you. And they taunt you. And they reject you. And they make fun of you. And it's like, ha, 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 look, look, he, he accepted Jesus. Look what happened to him. ha, 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 ha. We told you not to do it. And you're like, did I make a mistake? Maybe I made a mistake because my life, I've gone from bad to worse. God, what are you doing in my life? And then you hear these preachers tell you, oh, God has a wonderful plan for you. Well, whatever it is, it's not happening in my life. <laughs> it's not so wonderful. My life is not so wonderful right now. Your life will be wonderful if you submit to God and you resist the devil. 
and you let them change you and you stop complaining and you stop resisting God and, and, and submitting to the adversary the spirit of disobedience which works in the children of disobedience. And how many know that's a choice? We have a choice. Hallelujah. And you learn like Israel would learn to move when he says move and stop when he says stop. In other words, you're giving your free will over to somebody who's going to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Do most human beings live like that? Do most believers live like that? Do most believers even understand that kind of lifestyle? That kind of way of thinking and doing things? Or we just do things on our own and then complain to God because our life doesn't change? Do we let him or do we don't let him? I mean, how many of that? That's important. And does he know what he's doing? I mean, he put this whole thing together. I think he knows what he's doing. It's just a question of submitting to him and not fall into the same, same uh, pitfalls that Israel. That's why all these things are written for our admonition. They are written for our benefit. Yay or nay? Somebody say, I'm learning through these things. Do we have to go through the same mistakes? Or can we read somebody else's mistakes and not, not make them? We could learn from somebody else. Yay or nay? I like learning from them the things that, 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 that delayed their predetermined destination. And I like learning because it's getting me quicker to, the, to, the, to God's purpose in my life. Because I made many of the same classical mistakes that they made that kept them back. And many of us continue to make those classical mistakes. And there's not enough of us standing up and going, hey, guys, let's not do what they did. Let's do what he did. Let's do what Yeshua did. Let's submit to the Father like the Son of God, like the Messiah, like the way, the truth, and the life. And let's get with his program. And watch how your life will change from glory to glory, from good to better to best. Because that's what I'm experiencing. That's what my wife is experiencing. Glory to glory, that's what's promised in our life. Because the more we are like our creator, our God, the person of God, the greater our life is. The more of a conqueror that you are. The joy of the Lord is our strength. When you, when you do well in situations in your life, no matter what the situation is, it builds your faith. It builds your trust in the Lord. It gives you more impetus, desire to serve God and do what he says. And we complain less. And we question less. And we just trust God. Somebody say, I trust him. Do you trust him with your life? You did give it to him. You said, here, take my life. So when he takes it and starts doing things, what are you going to say? I don't like what you're doing? Or are you going to say, I trust you, Lord? It's like, it's, like, it's like Paul said, though he slay me. I think we got to read that again, Romans 8. I love that. I love that scripture. What, how many know Paul went through some stuff? Paul needed to go through some stuff. You think Paul was prideful when he started? Did you read about Paul's life? He was killing believers. Do you think he believed in Jesus? Verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. You know what I'm getting in my spirit? Don't look for people to justify you. Because people will not justify you. People will try to tear you down. Amen. Don't look for justification in people. Because 
we have a tendency to tear each other down. Who justifies us? God justifies us. Who is he that condemns? Verse 34. It is Messiah that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, verse 36, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And notice what verse 37 says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What things? Whatever comes at you, whatever comes at me, for I am persuaded, verse 38, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Somebody say, my God, my God. Now, one thing that Moses said in this week's Torah portion, which is awesome. i got to find it now. Give me one minute. We'll close with this. Because somebody say, when God moves, God moves. When we move without God, not good. But when we move with God, good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Numbers chapter 10, verse 34. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. Verse 35. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 35. And, when it, came, and it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you Flee from you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. What's the lesson? When we move when God moves, let his enemies be scattered. And let those that hate you flee from you. And when we rest, we rest in God. And he protects us. So somebody say, time to move when he says move, and time to stop when he says stop. And those who are led of the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Oh, yeah, let's get excited. Somebody say, don't make a move without God. But when he moves, move. He told Israel, gird up your loins. Don't even take time to bake bread. You're going to move. I'm moving you out of this place. And he said, get ready. You're going to move. You're going to move. And they moved. But when he said, stop, you stop. Let's pray that. Heavenly Father, in Yeshua's name, let us be led by you, Lord, like you led Israel, like you want to lead, those who are led of the Spirit. Father God, when you say move, we move. When you say stop, we stop. When you say rest, we rest. Return unto us, Lord, when we rest. When we move, let our enemies be scattered, Lord. Let those that hate, that hate you, Lord, flee. Let every assignment of the enemy against us be broken this instant in the name above every name, the name Yeshua HaMashiach. And Lord, give us discernment when you no longer lead us with smoke or fire. 
that you lead your sheep by your voice. Lord, give us discernment. As you said, Lord, my sheep hear my voice. Give us discernment. Give us ears to hear your voice, Lord. Then when you say move, we move. And then when you say stop, we stop. And that we submit ourselves to you, Lord. And we resist the adversary. And whatsoever things we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and whatsoever things we bind on earth. We bind everything that comes out of the mouth of the devil. Lord, give us discernment to hear your voice and to flee from the voice of the strangers and not to do anything they say or do. Father God, give us a spirit of obedience and discernment and let us wait on you, Lord. And please renew our strength in you, Lord. Let us mount up with wings of eagles. Let us run and not be tired. Let us walk and not even faint anymore. Renew our strength. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Comfort us as we go through whatever it is that you are bringing us through, Lord. And Lord, may we, may we never quit and give up on you, Lord, or even give up on ourselves. Let every tongue that rises up against us be condemned in the name above every name, the name Yeshua, Hamashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen, Amen. amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to close in a worship song that will.